Are you a scientist? What are you? People ask me. Good question. We're constantly defining and classifying ourselves so we can make order and function in society. Yet no answer can contain you. You're a person, a natural resource on our planet, able to direct your energy and attention however you're compelled and guided. Sometimes I'm trash Tara, collecting cigarette butts and impromptu conversation in the streets of Manhattan. You can recycle the toxic cigarette butts to keep them out of the ocean. Trash Tara is one of my socio-ecological alter egos who plays supporting roles to what I'm going to talk about today, recovering coral reefs through art as ecology. Rather than art about nature or placed in nature separately, I'm talking about art created with and for living nature at the ocean-human interface. One of my metaphors will be the tango. For years, I've been learning and loving this dance that relies on such subtle nuances of timing, interpretation, connection, with music, your partner, the floor, the other dancers, the entire space. It's euphoric. The loss of yourself while fully being yourself. It makes me high and it grounds me, bringing me into balance and keeping me well. Recently, a beautiful dancer, a maestro pianist, led me to dance on the beach. The music generated within him, though not audible to my ears, transferred to my bare feet, rhythmically pushing and pulling the soft sand through my toes, while the strong winds cleared the clouds from the moonlit night. We needed each other to live that moment with no false pretense of being self-sufficient, while simultaneously vividly aware we both knew we must maintain our own autonomous axis and role so that the dance can even exist. Similarly, coral reefs built by thousands of tiny animals coexist with symbiotic algae, the zooxanthellae, that live within them. These algae give coral their bright colors and provide most of their nutrients through photosynthesis in exchange for a protective home. And when the environment's supportive, these plants and animals live in harmony, appearing as one. They have done this for thousands, millions of years. But now when the temperature gets too hot, the delicate balance is thrown off, the coral misses a step, expelling its partner and threatening both of their survivals. The colorful reefs become white, bleached, starving skeletons known as coral bleaching. It's just one of the many devastating threats facing coral reef ecosystems worldwide. And there are some corals that are more resistant, resilient, showing signs of adap adaptation. But according to scientists, we're in a time crunch. Quick, flashback to the 1800s. Charles Darwin is working on his theory of evolution, while also embroiled in the second largest little known naturalist debate of the era, the coral reef problem. How are reefs formed? According to the book Reef Madness, Charles Darwin, Alexander Agassiz, and the Meaning of Coral by David Dobbs, the answer didn't calcify until the mid-20th century. Just as scientists were coming to consensus about how reefs are formed, they were already hypothesizing about how reefs are disappearing. Coral Reef Problem 2.0, or as I prefer, the Coral Reef Solution. People are exploring methodologies to protect, propagate, and monitor reefs to stop these massive die-offs. But again, time is the critical factor, the lack of time, and emergencies require urgent care. I own this iron lung for an immersive, interactive multimedia exhibit correlating coral health with human health through respiration and life support. I don't expect to resuscitate a coral suffocating under sediment, but I bought it because I see the corollaries between human health and coral health, and I want to translate the work I do into the ocean, into exhibits on land, making visible the abstract data and the invisible qualities of the ocean and our interdependence. I want people to be able to feel that and see that, making it visible and inclusive. We share the same oxygen as corals. We breathe the same air. We share similar innate immunity genes, and we depend on clean water for our survival and to prevent deadly epidemics. 
Now here's a clip from our first phase exhibit and prototype of Respire the Coral Corollary, created during a co-create residency in New York with James Tunick and Dan Baker. The exhibit is actually responding to sensors in the ocean and people breathing and moving in the space. Now humans felt the impulse, imagined and innovated, to save people from polio and coal gas poisoning in the 20th century with these behemoth ventilators. They, they wanted to save people. People felt the impulse to these coal gas ventilators in the 20th century. We can blame ourselves. We can blame ourselves for environmental problems. Or we can look at our heritage and be inspired by how innovation is a risky, messy, passionate, never-ending process. It's not a one-off. We can save coral lives, which in turn protect our shores, provide fish habitat, clean water, and beautiful natural beauty. This project is a project that I made for the museum, the National Marine Park, and we've been delayed for four years, and um, we went down to Mexico, which is where I flew in from here today. We we're actually completing right now our, completing our contract so that we can install soon. And we're using a process known as biorock mineral accretion, which was developed by Wolf Hilberts and Dr. Tom Garreau to restore reefs and develop aquaculture. And the way the process works is you run low volt direct current through the seawater so you're running electricity through seawater to your structure sculpture of any shape or size. And the electrolysis locally, it alters the pH. It raises the pH so that minerals, calcium carbonate and magnesium hydroxide, deposit onto the metal. So it builds up a hard limestone surface, which is a natural substrate for corals to settle on and colonize. In this video, you can see this is a project where the biorock process has been used. But corals can grow faster. They can survive some extreme temperatures, according to some studies. Like in the El Nino of 1998, the Global Coral Reef Alliance showed a 16 to 50 times survival rate in the Maldives during that hot year compared to some of the natural reefs. And now we're going to, in Cancun, we're going to be realizing the first ever biorock project for Musa to fuse conservation experimentation with cultural tourist attraction and international awareness. For 45 years, Cancun has been developed as a tourist destination. So close to a million visitors annually go there to see the tropical aqua-colored water and its inhabitants. The Mesoamerican Barrier Reef is the second largest barrier reef in the world. And it's in danger largely due to this really rapid human development. Some native coral species have declined by 98%. The northernmost point is in Punta Nezuc, which is the southern tip of the hotel zone, where we are planning to immerse our, sculpor, our sculpture. And that's right, you did hear right. We haven't installed yet because of bureaucratic delays. But I flew here from Mexico because we're right now finalizing the contracts between the resort, Musa, the government, and me, so we can finally install and transplant the coral. And in addition, we'll be adding live streaming webcams, the latest in 3D digital modeling for accurate coral reef monitoring, and lots of different sensors for monitoring our power supply and different ambient fluctuations around the sculpture. Like all of these additions are thanks to the red tape and delay and our dedication and our strong relationships. Even when on the surface it seemed like nothing was happening, all of the elements for success have been drawing together. During these three and a half, four years, the resort that we're working with has been built. Moose has hired an art historian as their executive director to ensure that the museum is vested in the leading artistic institutional principles. I'm collaborating with coral scientists and students at the University UNAM and multiple government agencies so that we ensure the project serves the local coral reef research and scientific intentions, as well as developing educational programming for tourism. 
So a lot of good happens in the slow delay, and not to mention, of course, the most important, the starring actors in the whole project, the, the coral reefs, the native reefs are waiting for us to install. Here you can see just last Friday, we were surveying the site, and very close to this, this is the hotel, and this is the, you can see the various seafloor bottoms, we're measuring distances. We'll locate the piece on something like this, kind of a sandy, grassy area, very close to the natural reef. But you see there's not a lot of fish there. And here's the reef right next, next door. And because it is an artificial reef and habitat, a lot of marine life and fish that are mostly kind of staying clustered close to this reef will actually come over and visit once we install. And on the tech side, we're adding, Autodesk is offering to train my team and the researchers there in Mexico on this latest photogrammetry process, which actually shows the volume of coral. So you're accurately measuring, you take hundreds of photos in the round of the coral and you get to see accurate growth measurement. It's so much better than the two-dimensional using a ruler or a flat photograph. We're going to take photographs of all the transplants and regularly go back and check so we can see how are they growing. Are they growing faster than the natural reef? And this whole, this will be taught to all the different students that want to learn. It's just a thing that Autodesk has offered. This is the work of Sly Lee, who's a Hydrus founder, and he aims to map all the reefs in the world using this process. And I guess he's going to have to go back. He's in the water for 12 hours a day or something, you know, taking hundreds of photos of each piece of reef. And as I said, we'll have live streaming web cameras as well, so that no matter where you are in the world, you'll be able to interact and watch and observe what's swimming and growing. It will have a continuous online presence, as Chris Anderson of TED said when he sponsored the webcams and project last year. So coastal communities really want to regenerate their reefs and protect their shores, and art is part of the global solution. You know, we must integrate our compassionate nature of humans into our intersecting environments. And hands-on cultivation, just like planting trees, is, is necessary and required to complement hands-off marine protected areas. So from the DNA-inspired helices to the name, which means life, Zoe will become a commemoration to cycles of life and death, eternal and ephemeral. Zoe Anderson also wanted to save corals from extinction, and her, her memory will live on in the corals building their skeletons into this ecological artwork. Thank you. Thank you.